Let's turn to Psalm 127. This is one of those psalms that teaches us that we can know so many truths in our life and yet not practice them. And what we say and believe can be right. This song was written by Solomon. And you know what his life was like. Can you believe that he wrote something like this? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. In vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Can you believe that a man who wrote that is in hell today? There are many people who feel that if we know the truth, and particularly if we preach it strongly, that means we are secure for eternity. Solomon's life is a warning to all people who know so much of the truth and who even proclaim it that it doesn't make any difference to God how much you know how much you proclaim. The question is how you live before him. So we can hear so much in the church about bringing up children and we can understand everything. Ultimately, it's a question of whether you practice it. We can understand everything. I mean, Solomon understood it so well as a young man that he could even write to preach it to others. And yet, he married so many wives and worshipped idols and went after money and destroyed himself. So that's a warning when we read and study scripture. It's good for us to recognize that how much we understand has got nothing to do with our life unless it's converted through obedience into life. It's like food, you know. You can eat a lot of food. If it's not digested in your stomach, it's not going to be a part of your body. You just throw it up. So, a lot of Bible knowledge, particularly you come to a church like this where you hear so much truth, I'd say it's a dangerous thing if you're not serious about obedience. In fact, I've said this before, that people who come here who are not serious about obedience, it's better you find another church because your judgment will be greater. But if you're serious about obeying the truth, what you hear can lift you to heights that very few people reach spiritually, if you're serious. And um, we have to see here, children are a gift from the Lord. And um, they're like a, a legacy for the future. We have to train them, it says here, to be warriors in verse, uh, arrows to fight against the enemy. That means I have to sharpen my children from early to be effective to fight against Satan. And that depends on us, especially the father. The Bible says, Fathers, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's the way we can make them sharp arrows when they grow up. And we have to start very early. 
Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. It's very easy to do that. You know, because as parents we have authority. We can lord it over our children and treat them like... Uh, we love them, I know. We sacrifice so much for them. But sometimes we can say things to them in such a way that we provoke them to anger. It's a clear command. Do not provoke your children to anger. And when your children get angry, ask yourself whether you provoke them to that anger by the way you spoke or by something you did. You need to repent. You need to apologize to them. That'll test your humility. It'll really test your humility if you have to apologize to your children. But if you have done something contrary to the word of God, don't you think you have sinned? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. What a word. I mean, the world doesn't follow it. But as Christians, we have to take God's word seriously. The commands of God are not easy. Like many, many other commands that we see in scripture, that you probably hear proclaimed only in this church, nowhere else. The others just leave it because they say that's impossible. But we must work at it, my brothers and sisters. I've been a father. I became a father 44 years ago. And uh, I brought up four sons. And in the early days, I'll tell you honestly, I didn't have victory over anger. I used to get angry. But I knew it was against God's word. So after I disciplined my children, I'd go and lock myself up somewhere and weep before God. And say, Lord, that was wrong on my part. Please help me to overcome my anger. I'll tell you, blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted and strengthened. If you are still defeated by anger, the chances are you don't mourn over it. Well, then you won't get a victory in a hundred years. It's only those who mourn who are comforted and strengthened. And I can tell you, you can try for a hundred years, you won't get victory over anger till you mourn. You mourn because you feel you hurt God by your anger. You've disobeyed God's word and you take it seriously. You know, in the olden days, in the Old Testament, if you sinned, you had to bring a, a goat. How much does a goat cost? It's quite a bit of money, right? Imagine if you had to bring a goat every time you sinned. You'd be bankrupt pretty quickly. And I'll tell you one thing that will happen when it touches our money we'd begin to take sin seriously. Sure. But when it doesn't touch our money, why is it uh, we are careful when you see a policeman on the road? Because of money. <laughs> he can fine you. Why is it we are not so careful about sin? Because there's no money involved. In the Old Testament, there was money involved. If you sin, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. It's one of the great areas that we have to overcome. And we have to weep and cry out to God. The discipline is right. Because it goes on to say after that, but you must discipline them. Ephesians 6, 4. So put those two together and what do you get? You get you must discipline your children, but it must not be in anger. That's exactly what I strove to do for a long time. It wasn't easy. I didn't get victory in one year. But a day came. And the day will come in your life when you'll find scriptures obeyed in your life and it'll make a difference in the life of your children. Now, if you don't take it seriously, then don't expect your children to take God's word seriously either. No, that's not fair, that you disregard God's word and expect your children to obey. Oh, ho. <laughs> how can that be? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's right. 
Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Both are in the same chapter. So, we must not be so eager to get our children to obey the Lord if we ourselves can't set an example. I believe the great need for our children is to see an example in their fathers and mothers that what they sing in the church and what they speak in the church is absolutely true in their life. Not that we are perfect, but that we are honest. That's what I told my boys when they left home. I said, you, you haven't had a perfect father. No, I'm not a perfect father. But I'll tell you one thing. You had an honest father who never pretended to believe something he didn't believe, who never preached what he didn't practice, or at least tried to practice, and who was honest about his failures. I'll tell you, it'll make a world of difference to your children if we really seek to be honest. And uh, we must not be satisfied with even one of our children who are supposed to be arrows that we have to fire against the devil to go to the devil's side. That's terrible. If you have ten children, every one of them must be on the Lord's side. Don't be satisfied. If even one of your children is not a wholehearted disciple of Jesus, you should be mourning. You should be waking. How, how do you sleep comfortably when your children are not disciples of Christ? How is that possible? I don't understand. How can you sleep comfortably at night if your children are not disciples of Jesus Christ, if they're not taking God's word seriously? Then it could be that you don't really believe that these things are true. Dear brothers and sisters, it's a very serious thing. It's a gift God's given us when we have little children. And it's a legacy for the future. And we have to take it very seriously. It's like if, the, if a company, you're working for a company and they gave you 10 million rupees in cash in your hand and said, uh, please get into the train and uh, take this to our office in Delhi and deposit it there. I don't think you'll sleep on that train. I won't. I mean, somebody could swipe that money. Do you really believe your children are more important than 10 million rupees, every one of them? And that you have to deliver them one day when we reach heaven to God and say, Lord, here I am and here are the children you gave me. That's in scripture, by the way. Turn with me to Hebrews in chapter 2. In verse 13. The last part. Behold, here I am, and the children whom God has given me. I want to charge you all in the name of Jesus. When you stand before God, when the Lord comes, make sure you can say that to your Heavenly Father. Lord, here I am. And here are the children you gave me. You gave me one, here he is. You gave me two, here they are. You gave me five, here they are. They're all here. It's a sacred responsibility. So I would encourage you, those of you who are very critical of other people, stop that. Judge yourself. One of the easiest way to send your children to hell is to let them listen to your criticisms of other believers especially in the church. This young person is like that and that young person is like this. <laughs> You're preparing your children for hell. It's one of the things my wife and I decided when our children grew up, that we wouldn't spend our time criticizing the young people in the church. They were not perfect, the young people. 
But we wanted our children to fellowship with them, imperfect but sincere young people. We then never allowed our children to despise the church. And there are people who have despised the church. Some of them, their children are still small. Just wait and see what's going to happen in 10 years. You mark my words. Just wait and see what's going to happen in 10 years. And I've seen parents who have taught their children to value the church. And I have seen how every single one of them love the church and value it. If your children don't value CFC, I would say there's something that was wrong in your home where you criticized people, maybe you criticized the elders or you criticized some brother, some sister, your children said something and you supported them. Yeah, 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 sister so-and-so is like this. Oh, brother so-and-so is like this. You reap what you sow. But you can repent. If you have done that and your children have gone astray, you can repent. I hope they'll come back. But those of you who haven't yet started making such mistakes, be careful. Because it's a serious thing to speak evil of others. I know young brothers who, you know, look down on parents who were struggling to bring up their children. And today they are parents. They got married and have children and their own children are going astray. Reason, you reap what you sow. Please remember that, my dear brothers and sisters. You reap, you sow what is good, you'll reap. It takes years to reap, it's true. You don't reap tomorrow. You sow, 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 and nothing happens. And one day you reap. And you wonder, how did this all happen? Well, you've been sowing for years. And then you see someone else reaping something good. Well, he was sowing for years too. But he was sowing something different. So when we have children, we're sowing things into their mind by how parents behave towards each other and what we speak about others, etc. You gain nothing. You don't gain anything by criticizing people in the church. Think of all of you who have spent time at home criticizing people in the church. Tell me something you gain from it. Can you tell me one thing you gain from it except satisfy your own lust for criticism? Nothing. But I'll tell you a lot of things you've lost and your children have lost. Let's repent of it. God's given us a gift. Let's take care of it and treasure the gift he's given and preserve this, these children so that one day we can present them to God and say, Here I am, Lord, and the children you've given me. May God help us. We really need his help, I tell you. Let's seek him for his help and let's repent of our failures as parents and seek to... Do it better in the days to come. God will help us. He's on our side against the devil. Remember that. But don't give him, the Bible says, don't give God rest till he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. That's a verse in Isaiah. Don't give the Lord any rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise on the earth. So don't give the Lord any rest in your prayer until you see every one of your children becoming disciples of Jesus Christ.